Hi there, this is Curtis Dieter. Like all of you, I am many things. A husband, a father, and a son. I'm a hard worker and a dreamer, a writer and a publisher, but underneath everything, I am made of rust and glass. You are listening to Proud to Be of Rust and Glass, a podcast series of conversations surrounding the creative journey and all the good and ill associated with making great art in the Midwest. It is the human side of colors brushed onto canvas, of words scribbled between covers, of sweat and grit bled into telling our stories. Real stories about real people doing what we love best, making great art. Today's guest on Proud to Be of Rust and Glass is Jasmine Townsend, a writer and English professor who teaches literature and creative writing. Jasmine's books, Fairy Tales and Space Dreams, an anthology of fantasy and science fiction, was published February 2019. She is currently engaged in an ongoing Space Pirates Dungeons and Dragons campaign. Jasmine, thanks for joining us today. It's great to have you on the podcast. It's good to be here. Uh, so let's start with the beginning. When did you first realize you were a creator? When I became a sentient being. I <laughs> um, as early as I can remember, I know that sounds cliche, but I would take construction paper and like write my little stories and have my little sister illustrate them and I would bind them with little barrettes. Oh, very cool. Yeah. Very cool. Do you have any any of those remnants left now oh, in, no, in adulthood? No. no. <laughs> <laughs> um, so were you always just a writer or have you ever, you know, dabbled in other types of art? Yeah. Um, writing has been the most consistent throughout my life, but I've been, I've done drawing. I've taken class, art classes at the art museum competed in ballroom dance. Very cool. I played violin and now I'm learning bass. Okay. So a little bit of everything. You got music, you got yeah. visual art, writing. Uh, what has been, which of those have been sort of like the biggest struggle for you, but you know, something that you just can't turn away from? Writing. writing. I. <laughs> it's always the number one. Isn't it's it? always the number one. Um, even after my stint with ballroom in which I was, I got really serious about competing early on okay. um, and my partner and I we ended up winning ribbons early on um, and then even after that I just I had a novel idea and after grad school I cranked it out you know in six months so yeah that's just, that's just been the one that always I always came back to cool um, what's the what's the novel that you cranked out doing right now that was what was it what was the title no, what are, oh. the, what are you doing with it right now? Oh, is, it, uh, is it published? Are you still, still it, tinkering? Or? It is published. Um, I published it in 2015, okay. and it is self-published. I don't usually talk about it because I feel like I didn't learn enough about publishing before doing the self-publishing thing, and I feel like it was such a cool idea, and mm -hmm. it deserved mm -hmm. more than what I gave it. But it is called The Adventures and Shenanigans of Bastian Falco. Okay. I love it. I love that title. <laughs> <laughs> there, There is kind of a misconception about self-publishing. I mean, a lot goes into it that people see, and it, it, it doesn't necessarily mean, oh, I self-published this book, so it's it's a lesser book. I mean, you have a lot more control over it. Yeah. Um, you have, you know, that creative drive. You don't have somebody, you know, talking over your shoulder, telling you exactly how to market it, yeah. uh, how to share it. So, so don't don't sell yourself short on that. I mean, that's that's an incredible achievement, and thank you. Um, I have one like that too that I kind of like hide in the closet and pretend doesn't exist. But it's an accomplishment that very few people get to get to do. So, as far as your writing, um, who were some of your early influences? Well, with Bastian Falco, that was definitely influenced by The Princess Bride, both the movie and the book, um, BBC's Merlin. The Hobbit, those kinds of things. Cool. Before that, when I was a teenager, I was very influenced by uh, Edgar Allan Poe and other 19th century literature uh, like Christina Rossetti, which continued into grad school when I was able to study her at the grad level. The thing is, when I was a teenager, I didn't have a style of my own, so my writing just sounded like Edgar Allan Poe. And I just, I really wanted to write the next great Gothic book and so I wrote my first manuscript, which was about, uh, it took place in a high school, a, an academy of vampires and werewolves. Okay. Which was before Twilight, <laughs> I would like to say. <laughs> Let's just add that one there. Let's get that yeah. out, out of the way right away. Yeah. Very cool. Yeah, I think, I think as writers we do that. We do 
sort of right in other people's voices for a very long time. And then eventually, hopefully, even sometimes when we don't even notice happening, um, it just sort of clicks for us. So yeah. that's very cool. Now that you have matured as a writer, how have those influences changed a bit? How have you, know, how have you de- developed that voice? It's changed a lot. It changed when I went to, when I started taking creative writing classes at the college level, and my professors were like, hey, nobody writes like that anymore. And it hurt my feelings at first, but it it does make sense. You know, you can't expect to sell a book that's written in 19th century English. So then that's when I discovered, you know, Octavia Butler, uh, Margaret Atwood, George Saunders, who still remain some of my favorites today. And I even met George Saunders. And was he, that when he came to the University of Toledo yeah. a while ago? Yeah, I remember yeah. sitting in his his presentation, and we had a little roundtable discussion with him. Yeah. And then he did his his bigger presentation um, after that. And I just remember thinking, this is the first real writer I've ever been able to sit right. down with, and this is amazing material. I was just fascinated the whole time. Uh, when he ended his lecture, I, I, I sort of thought to myself, this is it. It's over. <laughs> I want more. Yeah, I think exactly. I had 15 pages worth of notes, and it was just, you know, that was that was an incredible experience. I, I totally understand that. Yeah, um, we were um, being taught one of his stories, Sea Oak, and so I was very interested in how something could be considered literary, but also have this sort of genre element to it, like, oh, he's writing about zombies. So I asked him, like, how do you how do you do that? And he said, well, if the story you want to tell needs zombies, then it it just needs to happen. (laughs) As far as finding one's voice, he he told me how when he started writing, he wanted to be Hemingway. And so he climbed Hemingway Mountain. But when he got to the top of the mountain, it was only, you know, the shape of Hemingway's feet. And so that's when he started discovering his voice and that you know, struck a chord with me because for so long I had been trying to be Edgar Allan Poe, Christina Rossetti, Margaret Atwood. Margaret Atwood is another example of the very literary genre fiction. Yes, Um, I fell in love with Oryx and Craig. It's a great book. Yeah. Uh, That is very, very common though. You know, I started writing in the voice of Terry Pratchett when I first started taking my writing seriously. I just read all the Discworld books and it was like, this this humor strikes a chord with me. This is kind of my humor, my dry humor here. So I was writing as Terry Pratchett and realized the same exact thing. Like, I'm, yeah. I'm never going to be even a phantom of Terry. So I sort of, you know, you realize at some point in your writing journey that you have to be yourself and take those little pieces of all those people with you. Yeah. Because those are important and those are always going to be key to who you are as a writer. So something I wanted to ask you about, you, um, you've you been teaching classes, mm-hmm. uh, you're a professor now. Uh, what have been the biggest differences between teaching writing and the actual writing process? The biggest difference is when I'm writing, I only have my voice to worry about. But when I'm teaching writing, each student has their individual voice, or at least trying to find their individual voice. So grading is not as simple as oh, you lost points here because blah, blah, blah. I mean, if you know, if they didn't follow instructions or if the grammar is bad. But in terms of voice, it's not really something I can grade because it's them writing as themselves. Right. And so what I like to do is I like to give them small mini assignments throughout the semester so they can find their voice throughout. Um, and by the end, whether it's a, writing, a creative writing class or literature class or whatever, I want my goal is for them is for the last thing they write to be, you know, a more polished version of what they wrote in the beginning. Very cool. And these are younger adult students that Mm -hmm. you're teaching. Uh, How has helping them find themselves as writers helped your, you know, your own personal writing career? It has caused me to be more creative, to think more creatively, because not everybody has the same sort of process. And so I have had to think of ways, think of various ways to, you know, reach each individual student. And in doing that, I have found different things that might help me. It's always, I have a lot of teachers in my family, so I I, I have been exposed to the fact that they always, they change too. They learn along the way. Um, They evolve as people, as individuals. They evolve as, you know, whatever their niche is in the teaching world. Uh, And I just, you know, I thought it would be fascinating to experience the two differences of writing and teaching writing and and how you would juggle those how you would balance those how you would improve each of them yeah utilizing some of the takeaways from you know the other 
Um, and that's very cool that, you know, you're not only able to uh, learn from them, but you're able to learn about yourself through them, right? Yeah, it's amazing. Like teaching is not a, you know, a one way, a one way ticket like a lot of people seem to think it is. You learn as much from the students in some ways. Right. Oh, absolutely. In a lot of ways, I'm sure. Yeah. I'm going to take a complete shift in uh, focus here and talk about space pirates. Oh, yeah. (laughs) So you are currently involved in a Dungeons & Dragons campaign. Mm -hmm. That is one of the only nerdy things I've never really done. I've always known people who are, you know, dungeon masters who have been involved in those things, one-offs, that kind of thing. But can you talk a little bit about that campaign and how that's sort of uh, feeding into your creativity? I love D&D because it is collaborative storytelling. Because the DM, he or she, they make the the world, they create the world and the circumstances. But then we, the creators, we create our characters who have their own personalities and backstories. And so as long as you have a good DM who isn't trying to railroad you down their (laughs) story, it is a collaborative effort because each character has their own goals. Um, It is up to the DM to weave those goals into the story. So there is that. And it is, I think there is some world building on the part of the players as well, because when we are creating our backstories, sometimes it gives the DM ideas. So for my character, um, I don't know if you watch anime at all, but there is one anime called Megaloboxing. And it's basically like a sci-fi type of boxing where you have like metal gear when your arms and shoulders. My character is an artificer, an armorer artificer, so she can just create stuff like that. And so the DM was like, oh, okay. So then he created a tournament. So we have like a, you know, the old fashioned anime tournament arc going on. Awesome. Awesome. So that sort of forced the entire party to to be fluid and make room for the way that you were paving your path in the game and yeah and even through that like there we have a couple characters who have like a a mystery thing going on on the side so there's it's a whole thing there's this npc who gave who's giving our characters you know potions to help us in the tournament but then someone on the side is selling counterfeit potions so some people in the party are trying to figure out that mystery while you know some of us are fighting in the tournament and so a good DM will make sure that there's something for everybody to do. I love it. I love it. And I think, at least my theory is, a lot of the writers I know, especially writers who write in fantasy and science fiction, one of the draws to that type of role-playing game is you get to do what you love. You get to make up fantastical worlds. You get to create these characters in a setting that is much lower pressure than, oh, I have to write this short story by this deadline. Yeah. I have to put my book together. My, my editor's waiting for my book. And yeah. I think, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think that's a big draw to it because you get to do everything that you love yeah. just to have fun with it. It's, and it is so much fun. And we uh, design and paint our own minis. Awesome. I've painted about four minis. And so it's, it's, it's nice watching the, you know, watching yourself progress because at first you paint like flat colors and the face is a blob and <laughs> <laughs> and then at, now I'm at the point where I am using like different shading techniques starting to anyway cool. uh, and you use like wash to go over the paint so it goes into the crevices and it creates wrinkles and stuff like that awesome so the, another outlet for for creativity through and that's that's you know that's what we do these things for yeah what makes you proud to be of rust and glass oh so many things just in general, one of the things I love about the Midwest is how green it is. Even when you're just driving along the highway. Mm-hmm. But I love our, our metro parks that we have in Toledo. And moving, I guess, toward Toledo specific, we have so much. We have thriving arts communities, visual arts and performing arts. The, the cool gyms of downtown, like House of Dow and The Handmade Toledo, our Valentine Theater. Mm-hmm. Our, our zoo, our art museum, we just, uh, Toledo, and our, our um, libraries, mm-hmm. our library system, it's just, there's so much to be proud of. It's everywhere you look, isn't yeah. it? I mean, there's so much, so much opportunity for everyone. Yeah. You know, socioeconomic class, not 
you know, not dependent because the libraries are a free resource. The Metro Parks are a free resource of inspiration. Yeah. Um, all of these things are available to all of us as, as Midwest, as Toledo creatives, as, you know, just humans in Toledo. And it's, it's, it's so awesome. Yeah. One of the things we like to do is I would love if you have anything prepared um, is to hear a little bit about of, of your writing. Oh, perfect. I do. Awesome. So this is from a work in progress called Midnight in the Elder Woods. I follow the cat into the gray forest where the canopy's palpable shadow envelops me like quicksand. Oak and birk trees stretch like wooden giants toward the midnight sky where the stars glitter like mossonite gems. They're disco balls compared to the stars back home, but I'm not home anymore. This is the Elder Woods, still as the air before a tornado. As the cat leads me through the foliage, siren song wafts like a frosty breeze between the leaves and blades of grass. It chills my fingertips, numbs my ears. I run my hands together and press my palms against my ears to warm them, but my fingers still ache. The further I follow the cat, the louder the song echoes. It pierces my hands like icicles, drilling until the cold congeals like a knot of ice at the base of my skull. I crumble. My knees sink into the cold earth beneath the grass as the siren mistral whips around me. This is my curse, to wander these woods for a thousand years, or until I find my husband. When I wake, I'm on my back and I see the midnight sky. It's always midnight in the elder woods. But the siren song is gone. The cat lies beside me waiting. I don't remember which direction I was headed, and I'm not sure yet if the cat can be trusted. When that woman told me to follow the cat into the forest, my feet obeyed and marched me against my will into this timeless hell. His fur is long, white on the body and gray on his feet, tail, and ears. He regards me now. His eyes are big and blue like cornflowers, and I contemplate naming him. Are you leading me to Kai, I say, or are you just wandering? When I sit up, he sits up. When I stand, he stands and watches me, switching his tail languidly across the grass. I don't think he's leading me to Kai, but I don't think he's leading me to my doom either. So I walk, and he follows. Misty light shines through a break in the canopy, lighting the silvery waters of a river at rest. Though it doesn't flow, one end bends into the thicket, curving into the foliage like a sickle. The other widens into a lake. On the other side of the riverbed are sirens bathing their aquamarine hair, which falls in glistening bundles down their backs and over their full breasts. The water is so clear I can see the vague blue silhouette of their tails. The cat walks to the edge of the riverbed and they stare at him, then at me. Their black eyes hold me still, like that woman's curse. Their gaze robs me of the ability to move of my free will, but they are not unkind. Had me hooked right from the start. This is the second time I've heard you read out loud. And if you haven't considered it before, you should do audiobook work <laughs> because your reading voices is just so soothing and so engaging. Thank you. Um, so thank you for sharing that with us. Other than sort of what we've talked about with your early beginnings as a writer, with your teaching, with your storytelling through, you know, role-playing games, uh, is there anything else that you wanted to share about your creative journey? Yes, I'm in a way different place than I was writing, you know, even just a couple years ago. I was still trying to do the the epic adventure, and I have I hadn't finished any of those stories because I realized... I like to focus a lot more on like wordsmithing and craft and you know character development. Mm -hmm. And so those stories that are like plot heavy with like epic world building, I tend to lose sight of, you know, character development and craft and things like that. And those are, you know, the things I want to focus on now. And so I seem to have come around full circle because a lot of the stories I'm writing now are very they tend to be gothic in nature. And as you know, when I was a teenager, I was very much trying to do that. And <laughs> now that I've stumbled upon it you know, by accident, it's a little funny. Now um, you found a way to do it and, and a way to execute it and, and yeah. your voice to, to, to work in that. Now it is my voice. Yes. I love it. I absolutely love it. So where can people learn more about you and some of the classes you're doing and some of the work that you're doing? 
Uh, they can find uh, Fairy Tales and Space Dreams on Amazon or Barnes & Noble. So registration for the class right now is closed because it is going on, but you can go to Wix site, uh, Jasmine Shea, so that's J-A-S-M-I-N-E-S-H-E-A dot Wix site dot com. And then you'll find the first page will say Towns in Creative Writing. And then you can see sort of the things that we'll be studying. Yeah, thank you so much for, for sharing all of that and for coming and chatting with us today and for being on the show. Of you know, we really uh, appreciate you being here and appreciate the work that you're doing. Thank you. It was good to be here. Talking with Jasmine about Space Pirates and her creative process has really got me thinking. Should all creatives give role-playing a shot? While D&D is one of the few nerdy pastimes I've never tried, a lot of my writer friends play it, and it's great to hear it's helped her so much. This has been today's episode of Proud to be of Rust and Glass. I am your host and producer, Curtis Dieter. Our executive producer is Chris Pfeiffer. If you want to join the conversation, check us out at wgte.org backslash rust and glass. Until next time, thanks for listening. Now go forth and create. WGTE. Voices around us. WGTE is supported in part by American Rescue Plan Act funds allocated by the City of Toledo and the Lucas County Commissioners and administered by the Arts Commission.